Oh, got it. Thank you. And I can still tell one of the best parts of coming into Thursday morning Bible study is, is the conversation and the, and the nummies, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're going to have a little Bible study today. We're going to talk about two fish and five loaves. How's that? <laughs> Appropriate, yes. Well, actually, this morning, finish my apple. It's kind of a big event in our in our study process because we're actually going to wrap up a chapter. <laughs> That's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. It always is. Yeah. When I was talking to Pastor Bill this this week, I said, "You know what? We're we're going to get we're going to finish chapter nine. <laughs> <laughs> So then you start thinking back about, okay, let's see, how many weeks did it take us to get through chapter nine? Um, when do you think we'll get to chapter 11? Mm -hmm. It's next year. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for those kind words. Um, both here in the group and to those of you that are um, have joined us at home this morning, welcome. Um, for those of you that have joined us online, I'm hoping that everything is set up so that you can not only hear us, but that you can see us. Um, and, and Lord willing, the whole process maintains itself because my IT skill is, yeah, I'm never going to worry about that one because it's never going to happen. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then um, let's have a conversation about our portion of study for this morning. So the Lord be with you. Now let us pray. Gracious God, in gathering this morning with, with the taste of promise in the air, taste of sun and, and a new warmth, we continue to, to rejoice and to live in and, and simply to experience the stirring of life that you are about. And for that, we are thankful. We're thankful for your drawing us in to gather this morning, and we pray that in our gathering, that you would bless and guide our conversations to your glory, that you would bless and guide us and our growth in our learning, in our embracing not only your word in our lives, but through our lives, to your witness and, again, to your glory. We pray for those who are not able to be with us this morning, that you would grant them grace and peace. We continue to pray for Pastor Bill, for his healing, for his mobility, and for his recovery. We pray for Kim, and we celebrate the fact that, that she was finally able to be back in the facility again this week. And as we rejoice and see that as a sign of positive movement for her. We continue to pray for healing for her and, and for continued patience, both for her and for Scott as she recovers. For all that we are about today in our relationship with one another and with you, we place into your hands and in your name. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to Jerusalem. Good news. Bad news is it is going to take 10 chapters to get there. I don't know if, you know, <clears throat> maybe the best thing that ever happened is that Luke wasn't my pastor because I have a sense that if Luke was my pastor, he would be one of those that would have the three-hour sermon, <laughs> okay? Because none of the other gospel writers take 10 chapters to get Jesus to Jerusalem. You know, and there's almost a sense of comic relief here with our transition text today as, as we pick up a tone of urgency. And we'll be talking about that here shortly. So let's see. Didn't, that's good. Let's, yeah. 
Well, our text again is verses 51 through 62, which will help us wrap up chapter nine. Our goal isn't to check a box and finish a chapter. You know, our, our goal is to continue to walk and learn, um, learning God's word. And this is the word before us today. The nice thing is, is I think we'll be able to finish within the allotted time today. Okay. We'll see how that goes. I will share with you, I have far fewer notes on this week's study than I did on last week's study. So maybe that's a good thing. If someone would read the text for us this morning, uh, you can either do the first paragraph or, as the Spirit leads you, read them both. Okay, jump right in. Jump right in. When the day grew near for him to be received up, he sent his face to Lord of Grace. And he sent messengers, messengers ahead of him who went and entered the village of the Samaritans, and they prayed for him. But the people would not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to get fire from down from heaven to get soup done? <laughs> but he turned and his soup done, and they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me be first go and let me first go and bury my father. But he said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So you think Jesus is having a bad day? <laughs> it's yeah, there, there is a sense about that, isn't there? Well, as we walk into the text today, just a, just a little bit of if you what I what I like to think about a little bit of grass around the track. Okay, we call that background, but I, I like to think about it. it's the grass around the track. Um, yeah, as I'd already shared for Luke. Luke will take his time getting Jesus to Jerusalem. Interesting. That um, Jesus actually doesn't get to Jerusalem until chapter 19, verse 26. And it's like, whoa, talk about taking the long way home. Um, but there, and, and I think for, for Luke, a lot of that reason is, 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 that, is that Luke is telling in such detail all the preparatory teaching, witness, example that, that Jesus is about before Jesus arrives into Jerusalem, that, that Luke wants to be sure that his audience can really see that in Christ is the fulfillment. And so he takes a lot of time doing that. Like I said, he's probably one of those guys that you know, preached the three-hour sermon too. And in the right setting, the one that I'm not present, a three-hour sermon is perfectly appropriate. You know, one of the other things, and this is going to be a look ahead for all of us, is not just simply for today, but, but for, for all of us as we continue in a progressive study in, in the Gospel of Luke, now as Jesus has turned his face towards Jerusalem. Um, you know, my expectation is that when I tell Susie, hey, I'm going to go to the store, I go to the store and I come home again, okay? I don't, um, I'll go down to the marina and then go down walk the beach for a little bit and, you know, then go look at the puppies at PetSmart and, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I go to the store and come home. Okay. And, and you may find as you continue in your study in Luke is that Jesus is going everywhere but Jerusalem. So let's see if this will, if I can get the link on this. I, I'm trying a new way here. Yeah, here we go. And <laughs> here we go, and it doesn't even show. Um, 
Let's see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try something. Yeah, it takes well. It takes Pastor Mike a long time to figure out how do I get this thing up on screen. Yeah, I got the video on screen that day, but do you think I remember how? That's not it. Uh, that's not it. Well, you know, in um, let's see, let's go here again. When you're experiencing progressive and recurrent failure, you simply smile and move on and, and pretend it never happened. But, but just you know, as a, as a couple of data points, what we find it now moving forward into Luke is that in our text today, Jesus is passing through Samaria. And later in chapter 10, we find that Jesus is in Bethany. And then in chapter 13, he's in Galilee. And this is where the map would really be helpful because what you find is he goes boink, 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 Jerusalem. Okay. Um, then in chapter 17, he's somewhere between Galilee and Samaria. That's just that's all that the text will tell us. It doesn't say specifically where. Um, then chapter 18 through the very first part of 19 is in Jericho. So, so there seems to be a disconnect between this sense of urgency as he set his face to go to Jerusalem. You figure like, I'm going to the store. Okay, go to the store. Um, and then I'm going to take the long way home. And, and, and we, I think we're drawn to ask the question, well, well Luke, if... If Jesus is so set on going to Jerusalem, why doesn't he just go to Jerusalem? The journey itself, the, and, and for us, we talk about process. It, it's not just the destination that matters. As Luke, the storyteller, shares the story of Jesus. It's, it's the process. It's the journey. It's what happens within the context. It's the people and experiences that occur between chapter nine and chapter 19 that Luke wants to be sure are heard because this is an important part of the fulfillment that's recognized and realized in Jerusalem. And sometimes for us, that's, that's kind of a hard thing to do. We just, we just wanna get there, just, just, just get me there, bring me home. Um, and, and in doing that, we miss all the miracles of God as we're going. And this is just, there's just kind of a thought for you to carry forward it is, is, is as you continue in your study and look, is to really have your eyes and your ears and your heart open and attuned and asking the question, what am I learning about Jesus here? Because he's there to tell a story, not just simply then, but to tell a story to us today. And what we really can talk about is we can really say, well, from a theological perspective, what we see in this is, uh, is we see that Jesus, that Jesus is engaged in ministry while he remains faithful to an urgent mission. Okay. And that was the theologian talking. Yeah, well, we, okay. I like the way I said it better. But. <clears throat> it's just for me, you know, as, as I start this, you know, it would be so easy to go, and Jesus was all psyched up. He would, there, was, there was no relaxing. There was, there was no interruption. There was no pausing. He just was going to Jerusalem. I'll get there on God's time. But before I get there, there's a whole lot of God's work to be done. Oh, as far as timeline, you know, there probably is study that, that says from chapter nine until he arrives at Jerusalem, it was approximately so many months. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. 
you know. Either donkey or foot. Foot. Yes. And again, um, yeah, why not? Be sure that you have some of the salmon unless you're allergic to it. I just saw that. I was coming in for a pork. Yeah. You're looking at the Yeah. Make yourself, make it, leave yourself a little salm witch. Yeah. Um, that's why I wanted to show the map because what, what we find is that he's crossing himself several times. You know, it's not, and the cross is, I mean, that's not symbolic of anything, but it's, but what it, what it is showing is that he knows where he is going to land, but in the process, there is a lot to be done. Well, maybe two, we've been wanting to have a full castle. Yeah. But then would you be in the great courage? Yeah. <laughs> Knowing what was there? <laughs> That's a great thought. Would you have rushed in? Uh, not so much, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> yes. question. I think in the approximately three years of Jesus' ministry, he did point did you made up like now? Time wise. Halfway through his three. I think we're a third of the way in. One third. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Oh, I got I can click on it and the map comes up on my screen, but I can't throw it up on that screen. Uh, and I was able to do a video once, but I think I turned everything else off. <laughs> and I don't want to, I don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. No, because otherwise, if, if we go down the rabbit hole, then I'm not going to finish in time. And that will be three weeks in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and, and I think that that's, that's not only an important insight into the nature of God in Christ, but also an important insight and a reflection as we look in our own life mirror. You know, because often, you know, we get wrapped up with the objective or the destination or, or finishing a project, whatever it might be, and are we missing stuff? Are we missing important things? And naturally, the most important are people. And so, so might it might it be okay for us to slow down a little bit, to sleep into eight o'clock, to truly revel in retirement? Yeah. Say, listen, I'll be there. I'll be there real soon. <laughs> Okay. Well, let's look at this first part of the text. Um, I'll do a quick, a quick reflash on our verses 51 to 56. And I'll have to the glasses on for that. When the days drew near for him uh, to be received up, he set his face to, be, to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but the people would not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to bid fire come down from heaven and consume them? And Jesus said, yes, no, wait, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but he turned and he rebuked them. And then they went on to another village. You know, and that's a wonderment of this text. What does it, what do we learn by, in the framework of the thought that, that the Samaritans of this village refused to welcome Jesus and his disciples because he was headed towards Jerusalem? What, yeah, and I think about, what well, yeah, how did that unfold? His messengers, and I'm, I'm going to assume it was some of, some of his disciples. Um, 
went into the village and said, you know, hey, our master has need of, of some housing. And, and there's he and, oh, 70 of us, <laughs> give or take. Uh, we'll lose one along the way, but um, right now there's 70 of us. Um, and, and they said, oh, no, we can't. We won't accept you because you're going to Jerusalem. I mean, did they, did they have a, a, an old school bus that they had painted on the side on the road to Jerusalem? Were they carrying banners? Did they get T-shirts, Jerusalem or bust? <laughs> Who are these words written for? Is it likely that the people of the village knew? Well, first of all, I realize that the Samar Samaritans are the worst of the worst as far as being viewed as her heretical by the Jews. I mean, you're, you're far better off having dinner with, you know, with, with a common Gentile than you are a Samaritan. Um, So for me, one of the very first questions I ask is, why in the world would he have wanted to hang out, spend the night in a Samaritan village? Maybe it was more than a night. Maybe it was going to be a week. Who knows? But why, why not stay out in the countryside, send the disciples in, do a little grocery shop, and um, bring some nibbles back, and we can just kind of hang out, um, you know, hang out on a grassy field, which they did many times. Is that what Luke is trying to show us here? That's a wonderful insight. Is Luke showing us now in this, in this direction that Jesus is taking that, that there is an inclusive nature and quality about Jesus that even, that even works through rejection? Jesus wanted them to know that the kingdom of heaven is near and he would like to come and stay with them. Yeah, perhaps that was what was being said. Oh, and by the way, Jesus is a rabbi. What what did she say? I couldn't hear what oh I said. Oh, and by oh and the comment that someone made it there in the study. In the Doug, can you can you re reshare what you said? A little louder. Yeah, maybe Jesus. Um, <laughs> maybe Jesus wanted them to know that the kingdom of heaven is near, which is often what Jesus tells people, <laughs> and that um, and that the kingdom of heaven wants to come and stay with the Samaritans. Ellen, did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it. But there's also another story, I think, here, or another thing that we can think of, is that this was, Christ was on a time schedule here, and he had a lot to teach us, a lot to teach his disciples there, as examples of what we were supposed to do for many ages to go, to come, as to what we are supposed to do as Christians today. So Christ was on a mission to get as much done as he could during that time. Absolutely. <laughs> what what I heard what I heard what you said is that Christ was on a mission, and and within the framework of that mission, there was a lot of work for him to do. And so perhaps right. a part of the urgency language that we find here um, is the fact that there was much for him to do before the final accomplishment. And that's what the urgency that that in part the urgency wasn't simply to get to Jerusalem, but the urgency was was. The urgency was to reflect the will and the kingdom of God in a way that it would take root. Good insight. Wow, that's great. There was a feast of Jesus during the King Valley to Jerusalem to the Samaritans. The Samaritans refused open up shelter for the pilgrims. 
because of his antiquity, he is traveling between Delhi and Jerusalem frequently when on the east side of the Jordan River. So he's going against the custom, he's going quite through it to have another chance. But the women, the women listen to him. Mm -hmm. What have I got going? Am I still broken? Yeah, we're not. You're getting your computer to send the album. You need to go to Zoom. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't notice it earlier. That's why you can't hear. <laughs> um, so go to the Zoom meeting, click here, and then click over here and go to the audio, little carrot, yep. And click the, the owl's not plugged in. It is, it's, maybe it's not turned on again. It's not, didn't get all the way in. That's yeah. right. This is so fix it. Yay! Okay, okay. close that carrot. Okay. 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 And then go back to it. Uh, Here it comes. There it is. The carrot. The carrot. Echo canceling meeting album. Okay, that should be better. Sorry. Sorry, everybody at home. My Thank fault. You. <laughs> it's normal. <laughs> Margo, can you hear us good now? <laughs> yep. I can okay. hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. And Marge, you can hear us. And Evelyn, Evelyn, wave if you can hear us. Okay. We're good. I apologize. Justin came back in and breathed life into into the system. Well, let's see how it goes now. And please remind during the course of study, if you want to get more refreshments, get up. Please help yourself. Don't feel like you have to wait till the end. People want to know if you made the spread. Yeah. yeah. It's very good. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there now I lost my mouse too. <laughs> okay, what I'm gonna blame this on is last night was my first night on a CPAP machine. And if you if you have CPAP, you know what your first night's like. Yes, my husband, yeah. It took a while. Yeah, it takes a better not take a few months, better take like a few days. <laughs> so Well, I can see it. It's back there. Oh, look at that stuff. There, let's go back. Let's go back. There, let's go here. Cool. Well, that's why I always print notes as a backup, because sometimes you need backup. Okay, good, good thoughts and conversation around the hostility. There's the reality. Are we still down? We're, no, we're good. Are you good? Are you I just can't find my mouse. Oh. My, cur <laughs> my, cursor, <laughs> my cursor has disappeared. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm very high needs. You're, you're totally fine. Right. <laughs> you, need to, you need to find the cheese. <laughs> yes, I need to find the cheese. And he really thinks we're going yeah, to. Yeah, I'm able to go back. back. No, I, can, I, can, I, can just, I can't do this. See, this is not a touch screen. To make any that's difference pretty, to the eyes are looking this direction. You sure? Yep, I don't, I don't care. Let's not touch anything. The important thing is you have our people at home able to be here and see everybody. And see everybody. Right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I should have caught that. I'm like, why is this on his face? Yeah. Because okay. I kind of like to see. You sure I can find this? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Have some salmon. I did. Have delicious. some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now let, let's let's look at this other part here, which I, which I find just absolutely hilarious. Is um, is the disciples' response and recommendation to Jesus? Yeah. Burn. Yeah. Burn. Okay, uh, if, if someone has a Bible, if you could turn to Second Kings, I know I know some of those books back that into the Bible are kind of hard. 
But turn to 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Because first, I think it's important to recognize what the disciples are saying isn't something they just thought up. That there is kind of a history here. 2 Kings chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Okay. Sorry, what the verses were nine and ten. I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, son of. No, sorry, wrong chapter. Yep. Nine. Yeah. Then he went to Elijah, the captain, with his company of fifty men. The captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of the hill, and said to him, "Man of God," King says, "Come down." Elijah answered the captain, "If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men." Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. Okay, we have we have good faithful Jews here who obviously uh, <laughs> knew, knew the accounts of the law and the prophets, and you know when when things aren't going well, when there are unbelievers, and you know, and again at that time Samaritans were seen as the unbelievers of unbelievers. And what's interesting, if I were a Samaritan, I probably wouldn't have wanted a Jewish pilgrim to to spend the night at my house as well. Because what the discipline was, what they were feeling was, yeah, we're good enough for you to eat our bread and drink our wine and sleep on our blankets, but we are not good enough for you to call us brother and sister. And that's, that's what's going on in the background here for, for the Samaritans. Now, um, plus they were considered half-breeds. Worse. Worse. Yeah, non breeds. <laughs> so now we have James and John who um, who feel like oh, Jesus has been insulted. So what do we do? We get our revenge. Because after all, we're doing the will and the work of God, aren't we? Somebody gets in the way in the, of the will and the work of God. What do you What do you do with them? Smack them down. Smack them down. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> yes. When Jesus sent them out first, he said, in, you know, earlier, yeah. uh, but you come to a town they do not welcome you. Shake off the dust from your feet and leave. Well, that I don't. And that not half as bad as all the people in the town. Exactly. But Jesus has not, according to the way I read that Jesus had not even gone to the town. Oh, no, no, they're not there yet. But the disciples were. Uh, well, it says messengers were assuming disciples. The way to envision it is they see, they see the village down the valley, up on the hill, wherever it is, a couple, you know, there they would say a couple kilometers away, a mile or two away. And, and they and they said Jesus will go get you lodging, okay. and, and and they're they're trotting on ahead to, to prepare the village. Saying, got seventy one folks that are coming into town. We're we're gonna need we're gonna need the whole first three floors on Motel Six, um, <laughs> that kind of thing. And 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 we talked about the rejection, but now the response. And you're you're right on target. If you remember, in the first six verses of chapter 9, as Jesus directs and empowers the disciples to go out to claim the kingdom of God, to heal and to cast out demons, he says, now if anyone should not welcome you, don't be combative, don't argue, simply leave. And how quickly the disciples seem to have forgotten. 
know, is there sight for us today? You know, we want to witness to somebody that, you know, that we think needs to know the Lord, you know, and they reject us, you know, I guess that, not, you know, step away from it. You know, somebody else may come along. God may have somebody else in mind. You know, yeah. And um, I guess in that, we, we kind of need that attitude. Don't be combative. Just say, okay, let them think about it for a while or whatever. Mm -hmm. During, uh, during the period of the Inquisition, actually there were, there were at least two major periods of Inquisition in Southern Europe and in, in, uh, Spain and Portugal, that um, how, how, was, how was, and it was interesting, how was the crown, because it was really the Spanish crown, but uh, we could also say how was the church, how was the church about witnessing during that time? What were what was the response to those who were non-Christian who rejected? Who said, "Yeah, nice story. I don't want any part of it." Pardon? Were they saying that the people who were proclaiming the story persecuted? No. Wasn't that whole universe? Well, that no, that was a that was a that was another grand piece of history in oh. in, in, in Christianity. But during the period of the Inquisition, when there were large numbers of Jews and Muslims, and if you read history, they, they would call them Moors, if you read history written at that time, um, in the regions of what we now see as Spain. Um, Spain. That you know, the, the church the church and the king, there were, there were political problems with it. And as a result of there being political problems, there were religious issues with it. So how, how do we address that? What do we do with it? We give them the invitation to recant, to recant your, your pagan faith and to, ex, and to express and accept the faith of the church and to be baptized. And if you don't, we have options. <laughs> option number and it gets it gets to the point of calling down fire and brimstone it get it, it begin the, the first early process was you may take your family and leave the country expulsion oh but you can't take any of your property that becomes the property of the king as that moved forward the response got a little tighter. Let's try a little bit of torture on you and see how that works. And if torture doesn't get the result that we're looking for, tragically, in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, people were actually killed for the refusal. Um, and and we, we, we look at a text like this, we look at, we look at the history of Christianity and we and what we can realize is that how time and again over the course of history as the people of God we have lost the lessons of God and Jesus Christ and why it is again and again and again we need to hear those lessons one more time those lessons that say we are called to love all people we are not called into conflict that if there is rejection, just step away from it. Boy, what kind of world would we have if, if we could just step back from people who wouldn't think, who refuse to think the way that we do, because the way that we do, or the way that I do, is right. Everybody else is wrong. And now that's very tongue in cheek, and, and, you know, and I hope you know that. But um, internally, sometimes we script that. And tragically, sometimes there are people who act, and we see the horror of those kinds of consequences. Not too often. Yeah. Almost daily. <laughs> that, that even that even oh, yeah. happened. That even happened in the southwest of the United States when the Spanish came over into Mexico and came up into the pueblos and the Indian Native Americans. That they yes. had to be like them. And right. Yeah. And, and some of the, and with that, you know, thinking about, yeah, if you will, the, the, 
the grand conversion process to Catholicism with, uh, of, of the indigenous peoples in the yeah. Americas, the most brutal, the most brutal mm -hmm. uh, events that occurred with that were in South America and in Brazil and in what is now Bolivia. Well, even, even in New Mexico, the Southern, yeah. New, Southern United States, the same thing. As you say, even in New Mexico and in the southern United States, and some of the very things, the same things yeah. were happening. Yeah, for I wonder if let me, I want to see. Now, I'm not. I I can hear it. I'll reflect anything. Those of you that are home share because you're not coming through through oh, owl, yeah. but but I will share it with the group because I can do that. So. The final point with this is to recognize revenge and retribution are not are, are not part of the framework or the scope of Jesus' ministry. But but unfortunately, they can be a default or a first response within our human nature. And, and it's important that we would have that awareness. And my mouse came back. Yay! Look at that. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. Let's look at this next series. And in this next series, just I think there's an important note to catch. What we find is we find uh, three different people who come into, into the space of Jesus. And, and with those three, um, there is the question of following that gets raised. In, in the first, it's I will follow. In the second, it's follow me. And in the third, it is I will follow. And, and that's and what that is, is that's that's kind of a, a teaching pattern. It's like it's like a three-point sermon that that some pastors are trained to today, that it's that it's a pattern of teaching to take the same key point and bring it up three times. And I share that with you because as we look at these next verses, the question comes up, did it really happen that three different people, one right after the other, were encountered? Don't really know. Matthew only has two of these people. Okay, does that mean that Luke created another one? Don't really know. In all likelihood, what probably happened is that these were these were events, perhaps that did not happen in series, but events that were put in series to help make a point. Because you know, because you think about think about the human mind. If you want someone to remember something, what do you do? You tell them what the, you tell them what you're going to tell. Them. Then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Right. And in a real way, that's kind of what we find happening here now in verses 57, actually 57 through, through the end of 62. But uh, the first one, they, uh, Jesus and the disciples, they were going along the road. And a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lie his head. Wow. What do you think? I think Jesus was sarcastic a lot. <laughs> I think he had a sense of humor, didn't he? Yeah. We don't often think about Jesus as actually having a sense of humor. I think he's also pointing out that it isn't an easy thing to follow. And, and that's that's really what what this triad of, of teaching is about. I mean, we we've just gone through a rejection event, and the disciples' response to the rejection event what bottom line was it was wrong. It was inappropriate. And then right after that, we have others lining up now saying, I'll follow you. And, and, what, and what we will find is Jesus will say three different times, 
in a real way, you know not of what you ask. That, that this can, can be a heavy burden. That there can be costs associated with it. You know, and if we think about what just, what just happened at the Samaritan village, the messengers, the apostles, the disciples run into town and say, Jesus is coming. Oh, and 70 of us. Um, <laughs> prepare lodging. And the Samaritans go, you're, you, we know you, you're those people that are on the way to Jerusalem. And we don't let those kinds of travelers stay in our village because we're not good enough for you to be our brothers and sisters. So was this man a Samaritan? Don't know. Uh, probably not. We don't know. But what we, what we find is the, the, setting, the setting was Jesus and logic, wasn't it? <clears throat> there was no logic. So in all likelihood, what happened, what happened with Jesus and his disciples at least that night? They slept outside. They were, they were out on that grassy hillside. Well, it's just like when he was born. Stable. Yeah, there was no room in the inn yeah. for a different reason. Yeah, yeah. And and so he so Jesus and his disciples sleep outside. Yeah, for us we go. He slept in the woods. We know that something sleeping in the woods. Uh, and now someone comes to him and says, "I will follow you wherever you go." And Jesus has this little story about, about foxes. Maybe he did follow him wherever he went. We don't know. We didn't say that he didn't follow. We don't but know Jesus that Jesus warned him what it was going to be like. What it was like. Because they had just come out of a night like that, haven't they? Yeah. Jesus is saying there's going to be many more like this. And really, what he is saying in, in, in the text it is that, that to follow me means that there isn't a normal home. The home is something other than how we tend to think about it today. It reminds me of our teaching leader in Bible study fellowship when she was asked to be a teaching leader. She cried and cried and cried. Her husband came home and she was crying and he couldn't figure out what was wrong. But she realized what it was going to take to be that, you know, to, to put all the effort into being. And it was, you know, she knew she had to give up a few of her, of her you know, choice things uh, to, sure. to have time to do that, you know. And so that's kind of what Jesus is saying here. It's going to take some time. And you might have to give up a few things to do it. Jesus in this in this phrase is talking about rejection and loneliness. That it's not about it's not about riding a big yellow bus with yeah. Jerusalem or bus written on the side of it. It's it's about loneliness. It's about it's about rejection. It's, it's about it's about not everyone opening their arms, but sometimes people throwing stones. Sometimes you just have to sleep on a old stump, like the kitty in the picture. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I I picked this one be that primarily because the afternoon before when I got got home, cats out on the patio, and I mean, there's there's furniture chairs out there. They're covered, but still they would get she would get some cushion. Where is she sleeping? She's sleeping right on the fence rail. <laughs> and, and, and that whole thought to me um, nowhere to lie her head <laughs> but cats are different I mean cats are cats what can I say about cats we need to go oh, okay. <clears throat> you know but you know what was was Jesus being uncompassionate here telling the truth but also telling a story looking forward 
because this encounter isn't just about a person and Jesus. This 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 is a this is a this is about all people and Jesus. This is a, this is an encounter that in some way draws all of this in. What does it mean to be in relationship with someone who has a different sense of, of founding than we tend to think about? Ask anyone in this room, go, where do you live? You give me an address. We were to look just at this part of the text and ask the question, where does Jesus live? I can imagine him going, no. <laughs> yeah. It's a different way of thinking about things. And remember now, Jesus is not only preparing his disciples for the horror that's going to happen in Jerusalem. Luke is also teaching all Christians moving forward what it means to be a part of this family. There we go. Well, if that one was fun, let's look at the next one here because this one, uh, there's all kinds of little stumbles here. To another, uh, Jesus said, Follow me. So now, now someone isn't asking to join the group. Jesus is asking, join my group. That invitation. Follow me. But the person said, Lord, let me go first go and bury my father. But he said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow, what's happening here? Suppose he's telling him, don't put it off. But what off? Bearing, bearing the dead? No. Oh, when, when you're called, don't say, I'll do it in my own time. Uh, watch you do it now. Yeah. That's a good way to read this. But often, you know, when we receive the receive invitation, we, we want to frame that within our own time. And um, it's kind of like somebody saying, well, when I'm old, I'll go to church. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll take care of that when I retire. Yeah. Uh -huh. And a lot of people don't make it to retirement, do they? Yeah. There's a NIV study Bible uh, footnote that, that I think is helpful. I want to hear it, yeah. It says, for burying my father. It says, if his father had already died, the man would have been occupied with the burial then. But evidently, he wanted to wait until after his father's death, which might have been years away. Jesus told him that the spiritually dead could bury the physically dead, and that the spiritually alive should be busy proclaiming the kingdom of God. Yeah. Uh, Kenneth Bailey, who uh, spent about 40 years of his life living in the Middle East and, and became very, very familiar with, with Middle Eastern culture practices and disciplines, uh, wrote on this text that uh, that the code in many Middle Eastern cultures was for the son to bury, uh, specifically the father, generally we would say the parents. And to fulfill that, it would be necessary for, for the oldest son to stay in close proximity. That this was <clears throat> this was a, a, a cultural tradition. But, okay. okay. Well, that's one way to look at it. Doug, what you shared is, is another way. What you shared is another way. Another way of looking at it is also that, that he had already died. And now the son is simply waiting to, to close out a tradition and that, that traditional closeout in that time was after a year in a tomb, the family would go in and collect the bones and put the bones into a box and then bury the box. 
uh, because the tomb needed to be used by someone else. And you're starting to go, I'm getting a headache, Pastor Mike. <laughs> this was one of those as I was reading on it going, okay, you know, how many layers do we need to go down on this? Where I got hung up on this it is where it, it is what you see in uh, number the question on number three up on the board, where I go, okay, Jesus, I hear what you're saying. Where is honor thy father and mother in this? You have to wait a year. <laughs> yeah. You say goodbye internally, but you wait a year for the ceremony. Yeah. Of the bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually, the, the oldest son, assuming he's the oldest son, would be responsible for taking care of the mother. Yeah. And if you leave them, who's going to take care of mom if she's still living? We, we, again, my, our, our, our head starts to hurt here, doesn't it? So, is Jesus in any way saying tradition and parents don't matter? Do we, do we hear that at any point in these two verses? Doug's smiling. He knows where I'm going. With it. We do, it's not here, is it? Does Jesus, does, does Jesus say, okay, listen to me. Family is not important. Okay, listen to me. Traditions are not important. What Jesus is saying is that in me, in Jesus, there is something of either, of even, greater importance. Yeah, because the family and tradition is going to keep you from Jesus. That's not good for us. Yeah. And, and can traditions keep us away from a healthy, appropriate relationship with our Savior? We can. We can. You could say that spiritual life is always more important than physical death. You could, or, or, or yeah, this or spiritual death. Yeah, but spiritual and, life is more important. Than and the way that I'm wired, I just can't. I, I, I'm not a docetist. I can't. I, I can't really separate the physical and the spiritual. I, I see it all as one. That that, and not as a yin and yang. But I, I, I think what. What is spiritual and what is physical are are deeply and intrinsically linked. You know, you go back, go back to Genesis and, and what did God do? He scooped up, he scooped up mud from a mud mud hole, and he shaped humanity. And then he breathed into it. Yeah, that breath being the the breath of God, and when we hear the Pentecost, we meet that we meet that breath again. That that they're that they're tied, and I think I don't know. I don't do well going. Let, let's separate them out. I think we're I think we're one package. So what what maybe what maybe we can draw from this is what Jesus is 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 getting people to start thinking about is that what is most important is the kingdom of God and, and that in, within the framework and the announcement of the kingdom of God there there is a priority that will bring peace the priorities and the life that you found in your traditions or finding a new expression, perhaps. I, <clears throat> I think it's, this is Kim, and I don't have much of a voice. Hi, everybody. Um, but it's interesting that Jesus says, follow me. And then when the fellow says, I've got to go take care of my father, he says, well, then go. So his first word is follow. And then his last word is go. Yeah, good point, Kim. What Kim is sharing is, and this is twice in one week, Kim. Hello. And, and I'm sorry, but the, for some reason, we're not able to show people on screen. I don't know. 
Um, I just, I'm having some techno challenges today, it is what it is. What Kim said is that, is that also to recognize that within this text, um, the invitation is given, come follow me. And, and the response, the response is ultimately, well then go. You know, when the person says, well, let me go take care of my, my family and, and then I'll be back. And what does Jesus say? He says, go. That, that there's a measure of grace in this, isn't there? Yeah. And where does he go? He probably goes back to his, you know, his people, his village. Um, I mean, we're reading something into it to say that, that we don't know where he goes, but, you know, his concern was with his family. Yeah. Well, you know, um, actually, what as I look at the text, um, Jesus' response here is what he, what he says, whether to the person or to the gathering, is... Um, leave the dead to bury their own dead, but as for you, do what? As for you, go. Go oh, and proclaim. Proclaim. So, so that so that emphasis still comes back to follow me. And, and that's where what Doug had shared in in the study Bible kind of adds and makes some sense here. That perhaps what we can read into it is that well, those that are those that are not in some kind of life-giving relationship with the Lord, they can take care of that stuff. I don't know. Okay, so if we're not confused, overwhelmed, or going, what in the world? Um I think the final question here for us is, uh, so what is it that's, that's, that's holding us back? And this is where I see within each one of these small vignettes, there is opportunity for us reflection and consideration. What's holding, what do we put in front of, between ourselves and Jesus and God? I'll get to it. I'll, 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 I'll get to it. Okay. Once I... And I and I I do this too. Once I you know, get this done. Get this done. Um, well, this is a really real issue for modern families because if you've got young children, you have so many things that compete with Sunday uh, worship and with you know Wednesday youth and confirmation. You know, there's sports and scouts and, you know, any number of things that um, are important, but worship is important to you, so how do you balance it? Good point, Kim. Um, well, today, and it just didn't happen yesterday, it's been, it's been progressive for many years, is that there are so many things that fill and consume our lives. Um, that, that we say are important, and many of them truly are important. Um, that at the end of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of our life, we, go, we realize <laughs> we, made, we, we made like this much room uh, for our walk and our relationship with the Lord. Some of us, you can remember a what will remember it, um, there were not sports on, win on Wednesday nights. Uh, you know, I was always in sports in junior high and high school. Here's the that. This would be on Monday night. Yeah. Monday night football. You know, there was Monday night. Monday night was when the junior varsity would play. Friday night was when the varsity played. Wednesday is when we would do a uh, half gear and we would practice until 4.30 so everyone could be home by 5 o'clock because Wednesday evening was church time. Didn't matter what church, but, you know, and so for Lutherans, a lot of us went to confirmation class on Wednesday nights. Uh, other traditions they actually worshiped on Wednesday nights. Um, and, and, and little by little, you know, that kind of got, that, that kind of got lost. You know, I kind of, I, I kind of scratch my head sometimes because 
you know, as I have been at different churches and have listened to conversations on when are we going to schedule our, our youth week at XYZ camp? And how ultimately what we'll do is we'll schedule that week um, around all the other stuff. Other stuff comes first. We have planned. Yeah. yeah. And, and 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 this is a, this is kind of a it's not a comfortable reminder and sometimes to be shaken in our self self selfishness or self centeredness is uncomfortable it doesn't feel good it is to ask ourselves what is most important here what is Jesus saying is most important here the kingdom of God are all these other things important? I think that Jesus would say yes. Community involvement is important. Sports are important. Um, music lessons are important. Uh, and you just keep adding ballet lessons, whatever, add to the list. These are important things, but what is most important? Are those are important questions. These are good questions. Well, let's move on. Because uh, you, you didn't. Move slide projector. Let's try you one more time. There we go. This is my favorite one because I spent summers growing up on a farm. I know all about. I know about plows. Yeah, that looks just like her there. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, he's a little shorter than I. Um, <laughs> Verses 61 and 62. Now another person came up to Jesus and he said, I will follow you. Now we've, now we've gone to, I will follow you, follow me, to I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me run home and say farewell to those at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. Remember those days when we, uh, there's enough of us in this group that remember those days uh, before car seats were mandatory. Before there were seat belts in the back seat. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and how, yeah. And, and, yeah. I, I can remember mom driving one handed, standing inside the car, managing us three kids in the back seat. And if you've ever done that, what tends to happen to the directional first stability, but just the general direction of the vehicle itself? Usually because you're turning this way, you'll drive the car right off the shoulder. Much better to drive it off the shoulder than into oncoming traffic. But, but the truth is, is that our direction follows our attention. And, and the same holds through if you're out plowing. The first summer that I went over to my grandparents and worked for one of my uncles, I mean, when, when you would go out and you would rod weeder a field, you're rod weedering 640 acres at a whack. And um, there's a marker at each corner. You're pulling 60 to 70 feet of equipment behind your tractor. And, the, and then, and so keep my uncle goes, now I put a disc on the tractor to help you see where you have been. Well, I thought that that was really great. Shows me how to start the tractor and he takes off to do something else. I, I, I start pulling this thing through the field and, and I make, make one full swipe and I make the turn to come down the other way and I'm going in. And this is a crawler tractor. This is old fashioned day. And I'm turning around watching the disc that I'm dragging to see where it marks and the disc from the last lap where I was. And I'm going like this. And I can't figure out why I keep going to the left. <laughs> and when I finally stopped, you can see this perfect curve. To the, I mean, it was like I'd planned it. It was because I was looking back where I was. Instead of looking forward, instead of looking, instead of using the marker that I'd already laid down, to help me track my direction going forward, I was using the marker to help me assess where I'd been. So then what happened? 
Well, so I, I stop and go, oh, he's going to have fun with this one. Um, because I'd never, I'd never uh, ran equipment in a field before. Well, what happens is that you keep go, as you're going back and forth, you know, you reline yourself up, restart, go back and forth. It erases all the mistakes. So, yeah, so, so he never, he never knew other than the fact that I told him. <laughs> but he knew that would happen if you had never done it before because he had problems. I'm sure that he knew that that I was going to I was going to have to learn how mm -hmm. how to make all of this work for me. Yeah. But but so what we find, you know, what we're finding here in, in this text is you know, I, I see a message that if we look back, the only thing that we're going to accomplish is some pretty nice circles. And, and, and to think about it, in the life of the church, can you think of any good looking back phrases? We, this is the way we always have done it. Yeah. And, and so, well, sometimes it's really good. Um, sometimes it's not helpful. And, and that's what's important to recognize here is, you know, we can get wrapped up into going, okay, everything that was yesterday, we have to throw away. Not at all. I think what we need to do is we need to look at everything that was yesterday and to ask the question, is this life giving or is this life taking from us? In other words, um, are we able to find life and express life in Christ by keeping it or is it taking energy? <coughs> but yeah, we've always done it this way. It, it is one. Any others? Oh, Pastor Mike, can you get to the chat? It's probably easier to read what I wrote rather than hear my bad voice. No. Okay. So, <laughs> See, so. if I it, let me, I, I tried to call you up. Let's let's just enlarge it. Yeah. What? Um, yeah. I see that you put a chat in. Yeah, but everyone's not going to see this chat, Kim. No, that's why I thought you could read it. Maybe. Yep. Okay, let's see. So Kim wrote, Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem, toward the cross. The last few verses convict us that we're not fit for the kingdom of God, but Jesus will ultimately take care of it for us on the cross. His true destination. Certainly a looking forward um, text there, Kim. Uh, Pastor Mike, true that our direction follows our attention, which can veer, but as above, Jesus' attention is always on the cross. Yeah. Could y'all hear that? Okay, good. Agree. Now I'm wondering, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to turn this off. I don't want to turn Zoom off, Kim, so let's see what happens. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay, good. I just thought it was interesting that he's so, you know, the first line is where Jesus sets his face, and then the last line is where we set our face. Right. Yeah, and that's, you know, there is, there is a building transition in this closure of chapter, of chapter 9, where more and more we are finding that, that drawing in. Of, of the disciples and of others for the work of the kingdom. And, and that's where in next, in next week's uh, study section, you know, the, the theme is about the calling of the 70 and, and about the proclamation of the harvest. And, and this, this once more is, is Jesus saying, you're a part of this too. I have, a, I have a key role. You all have an important role. One of the things also to note, uh, I think, is that um, is sometimes we want to look at a text in isolation and to look at these verses in isolation. And, but, but I think it's important to recognize that, um, that there is, that there is, there are recurrent, there are numerous stories, even of Bible heroes who constantly 
would re-discount themselves. Think about Moses. What did Moses say about himself? Not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Who am I to be the one to do this? Yeah. But in this, you know, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back. He said for the service, for, for service in the kingdom of God. Is he kind of saying, I don't want a half hearted commitment? I want. I want you all in. And, and you know, because we can be, you know, the disciples were looking for him to be a, a big leader and overcome Rome and so forth. Sure. You know, the Romans. Are, and I'm just wondering if he's saying, you know, if you're going to follow me, I need the full commitment from you. And it isn't going to be just, just, there's going to be a cross, not just a crown. There's going to be you know, judgment, not just mercy. I, I think he's, he's trying to get them to think realistically. Okay, how, how committed are you willing to be? And I, and, and I appreciate what you say because I think there's elements of all these in each of these three vignettes. You know, because, because that first one is really, excuse me, the first one is really talking about, although the language isn't there, it's talking about a cross. Mm -hmm. it, it's talking about a life a life of suffering, a life of challenges, talking also about a life of rejection as it stands against what just happened at the Samaritan village. Yeah. yeah. And, and then we move to that second one where, where we find the person going, well, I'll join up with you just as soon as I X, Y, Z. And, and what, what we draw from that is we need to, we, Jesus is calling our attention to what it is that is most important. And what, what is most important, not saying these other things don't matter, what is most important is the kingdom of God. It's like you're driving down the street, you see a house on fire, but you're on your way to the grocery store. What's most important? It's the house on fire. And we go, well, that's a silly example, Pastor Mike. Um, it is, but, but how often, uh, how often as, as a world will we take the most precious gift that God has given us, which is salvation? And say, I'll take care of that next. I'll give it time or two. You know, and then this whole example about, about plowing the field. About and and I think another you know, one one thing is you kind of we kind of joke about going in circles with this with this text because I think that's an easy inference you know but but the other but the other is that whole thought of and if if you grew up in a farming family or you knew a farming family when was the work done it's never done is it it's never ever done. I mean, as soon as harvest is done, you start preparing for the next planting. Yeah. It's never, ever done. Well, that's just like a homemaker and a mold. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're, you're constantly. Yeah. yeah. So if you're never, ever, if this is what's most important in your life and you're never, ever done, is there ever going to be sp space in your life for the kingdom of God? There, there can be that that sense of reminder here that, that ultimately what it call what what all three of these vignettes call us back to consider and, and, and I think as learning to the disciples is, is for us to ask what matters most what what is most important and 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 that's manifest not only in our hearts but in our lives so You'd be really surprised to see what the next slide is. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Ne next slide is next Thursday. Oh. <laughs> Yay. Our prayer is that Pastor Bill will be feeling a little bit better and, and will be at a place where he would where he would want to teach the class. But but our lesson next week is verses one through twenty. 
of chapter 10, which is the, which is the calling of the 70 and the sending to the harvest. So we have the call and send, which, which is an excellent outgrowth of what we've just experienced in our text today. So let's close by together um, sharing those words our, our Savior has given us to pray, whether it's in times of being alone or when we do gather as we are here. So, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. This is not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you. Blessings to all of you. Thank you for joining. Please, and those of you at home, you're not going to like this. Please have some more salmon spread before you leave today. For those of you that are home, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your patience with all the digital hurdles that we kind of went through today. Thank you for allowing me to, to, to share the words that, that you wanted everyone to hear. And, um, and God's grace and blessings to you through the rest of this week.